Now, universal credit is supposed to replace six long-standing social security payments, but since its inception in 2010, it's come in for a lot of criticism. Beset by delays and blamed for the rising of debt and rent arrears and also people using food banks. Well, now a group of influential MPs has said the new system is causing unacceptable hardship and difficulties for the very people it was supposed to help. And it's accused the government of turning a deaf ear. Well, the Department for Work and Pensions say they are already addressing some of the findings in the report. In a moment, we'll speak to some of those affected and a man who helped design the system. But first, eight years on from it being announced, let's take a look at where we are with this huge welfare reform. Universal Credit is a new welfare system that replaces six benefits, including housing benefit, job seekers allowance and working tax credits, with a single monthly payment. The government announced a plan in 2010, saying it would be fully implemented by October 2017. But after repeated delays, it is now unlikely to be fully operational before 2023. By March of this year, the government had already spent £1.3 billion on the scheme. So far, fewer than 1 million people have been enrolled, but eventually around 8.5 million claimants will receive universal credit payments. Critics say that the system has caused hardship for those who are claiming universal credit already, with increases in debt and rent arrears and the number of people making use of food banks. But the government say the system is helping more people into work. Well, let's talk now to Sarah Spore, a mother and full-time carer to two disabled boys who says the system has left her emotionally broken. We can also speak to former bar manager Neil McVicker, who was forced to claim universal credit after he was diagnosed with a brain tumour in 2016. Also with us here in the studio is Devon Galani, director of the Policy in Practice think tank and one of the team who designed universal credit. And then also with us is Conservative MP Heidi Allen, who is on the Work and Pensions Select Committee and has concerns about the system. Thank you all for joining us. Sarah, first of all, explain how one of your sons being on universal credit has affected your family. Um, well, immediately um, we lost two and a half thousand pounds that first year and then we have a two thousand recurring loss in our income. Um, apart from the, just to the process of actually applying for it was humiliating and just like I, Daniel Blake, when you go to the job centre you have to sit there in a room in fact, in the actual reception area, fill, trying to do these online forms, and there were a lot of people whose English wasn't their first language and weren't com computer literate, and we all had to sit there putting our hands up while someone came across to try and help us, and then the system timed out. I, th I just, in the end, I just couldn't do it, and I actually had got a, um, a disability advisor sitting there with me who'd, who'd taken me, because um, she said, oh, I'm so pleased you're my first universal credit claimant, so I'm going to come and help you, and neither of us could work it out. So I had to go back you know, and did it at home, and, and then... For the first 12 weeks, um, the DWP don't consider my child to be disabled, even though they've known about it for the, you know, since he was three. So when we got all the money through, they just don't, the disability part just vanishes for the first 12 weeks, like a waiting period, and then suddenly, oh, yes, they are disabled again. So that's how come we lost so much money. But as I said, it's 2,000 recurring. And you said you're emotionally broken by it. Just what effect has it had on your family? Um, well, it's difficult enough um, being a carer. It's difficult enough in this hostile environment where people think all disabled people are scroungers. And then you've, and so then, and you've got even less money. Um, you know, I'm constantly in a war with someone to try and get funding or to try and get support for my children. Um, you know, at the moment I'm in, in a drama with Hounslow CCG who don't want to fund um, supporters for my children. But so just to add all that on, and then you're applying for PIP and all those sort of things, and nothing, you can't do a stick and paste from one form onto another. You have to start all over again because all the wording is different. And I just feel I'm eloquent and able and struggle to do it. And so there are so many people, you know, who just, just wouldn't be able to do it at all. And it's, it's just not OK. Let me bring in um, Neil at this stage because Neil is also with us. Um, Neil, tell us about your experience on Universal Credit. Um, I can recognise a lot of similarities between what I've just heard there. Um, it was really difficult to apply. I applied um, and was sent to the job centre a week or two after my brain surgery. Um, I was um, expected to fill in all these forms and everything. 
um, it was really difficult for me and, and again I'm eloquent in everything and I can understand it. And it, it would Neil, just be... forgive me for interrupting, <coughs> did you get any help at the job centre for filling in a form a week after you had brain surgery? Um, not really, no, um, I did most of it at home. Um, I didn't really get any help or support through the job centre at all the whole way through. Um, my, my work coach did not help me find work, um, I just took it upon myself and there was a, a few charities that really helped me. Um, but I didn't have any support through the job centre um, at all, really, to be honest. Devon Galani, I want to bring you in on this. We have spoken to so many people on this programme over the course of Universal Credit being rolled in in different areas. It's the same things we hear time and time again. It's not working, is it? I think the biggest, the hardest thing for me to hear, having been involved in designing Universal Credit way back in 2008, is that I got, I got interested in wanting to change the welfare system, having been in very similar situations uh, to Sarah and Neil, having dealt with the legacy benefit system, where you've got to basically do the same thing three times. You have to go to the job centre, they send you back, you fill in forms, they don't tell you about housing benefit, you might not get all of the support that you're eligible for. And what, um, what the most difficult thing for me to hear is that actually probably your experience of universal credit is very similar to, or trying to go onto it, has been very similar to exactly what it would, would have been under leg the legacy system, and the opportunities to try and redesign, redevelop, rethink the system to make it much more supportive for claimants haven't really been taken. That's one of the hardest things. I think the other point is... So the government hasn't done what you told it to do? I think, I think yeah, just frank, frankly, the, the opportunities to try and be, to, to create a system that's much more supportive, uh, it, it's on a journey toward trying to do that, I suppose, I, I suppose, if I was being as generous as possible. The, the, the Department for Work, changes have been made to Universal Credit to try and, try and improve it. The government have been trying to do this approach called test and learn, which um, I am optimistic about, but it's certainly taking far too long, and it's taken far too long for both, both Sarah and Neil. Heidi Allen, um, this is a flagship Conservative policy. We've heard numerous uh, examples uh, of how this is not working. Is this not time just to abandon this policy completely and just say universal credit is not working in practice, therefore we get rid of it? No, I don't think it is right. Um, and the NAO, who have been looking, as, as you'll know, intently at universal credit, have said that actually we need to fix it. It is too late to stop it altogether. Um, but all the audience guests that you have here today um, are all absolutely right. For me, there are, and I sit on the Work and Pension Select Committee, so our committee has been looking at it in detail since I was first elected in 2015. And we have constantly pushed out reports saying, fix this bit, fix that bit. And in fairness to the government, they have so far. But I think there are three major things that need addressing. One, this issue of getting onto the system in the first place, being left with a monstrous application form and very little support. Well, the government announced at uh, the conference just recently that Citizens Advice will now have the national contract of universal support, which always should have been there. It's not just an IT system. It should be the support that goes with it, and that has been lacking. So I'm reasonably optimistic that that will get fixed. But the two other things that must be fixed, and I hope to hear it in the budget on Monday, the funding in the system, so the amount of money that people are supported by the work allowances, that needs to be restored to that which it was before the cuts were made in 2015. And the further thing that needs to happen, this five week wait, although it was cut from six weeks in the budget last year, which cost a billion and a half, brilliant, I think enough now. And I've said this a number of times, both in the House, in the Select Committee and directly to the Secretary of State, I think, given that 60% of claimants now are asking for these advance payments, these loans, the risk of them going into debt as a consequence having to pay back that loan, let's just make that first advance payment, day one, week one, your first payment. We can adjust it at the end of the month when we know what your income's been, but I think we just have to get away from this fundamental design flaw of five weeks. There's a reason that 60% of people want an advance payment, and frankly, I've had enough of it now. We have just got to change the design. Heidi Allen, as you're speaking, Sarah is shaking her head to some of the things you're saying. So, I, by all means, Sarah, speak to Heidi. Yeah, the, the CAB taking on the contract that has terrified people in the community that you know I know carers and people you know on low incomes they thought that the CAB was somewhere safe they could go citizens advice Cit bureau. sorry citizens advice bureau yeah um, they could get, go to get information I mean I went a couple of weeks ago to the citizens advice bureau to actually ask about universal credit because I'm thinking of going back to study as a reward for all my years hard work as a carer and I knew that there was an issue if I was on universal credit. So at the moment, I'm on tax credits. My older son's on universal credit. Now, if, I, if I'm on tax credits, I can go and study and I can get a student loan. However, if I'm on universal credit, I can still go and get a student loan, but it'll be treated as income, in which case I won't be able to afford to study. 
So, uh, you know, as a long-term benefit, um, you know, to my working life, I won't be able to, you know, it's just ludicrous. Stephen, was it designed like this? I think some of the biggest problems around universal credit are that it wasn't designed like that. It was actually designed as being more generous than the legacy system it replaced. But it's less when, generous. When it, when it went into, that, that was from the design perspective. When it went into government, it was made broadly as generous. So when it, went, when it went into government, money was taken out of it. And actually what's happened back in 2015, just recently, even more money was taken out of the system. So I think one of the core issues of, uh, around universal credit is that it's been conceived in this environment where you've got a, a government that's trying to take £12 billion out of the benefit system. Universal credit itself takes a further £2 billion out of the benefit system. As Heidi says, we've got a budget on Monday and we really hope that actually money goes back into the system, not just to restore the work allowances, but also, as Heidi said, make sure that actually it's a, some of the decisions that have been taken around it are more generous. So you're not waiting five weeks for your first payment. That's, a, that's for, for the, to, to kind of try and balance the nation's books on the backs of some of the lowest income families in the country is, I think, a terrible decision to have made at the, at the very outset. But it came from this environment of, mm. of a government that's tr just uh, and a department that, that's trying to save money at every corner. We are getting so many people getting in touch with us with their experiences of um, universal credit. And thank you so much for um, getting in touch with us about that. Cathy on Twitter says, please do remember my family as you tuck into your Sunday roast this weekend and think how families like mine have no such luxury as we're having to choose between eating one meal a day mm. or heating. Nick's also got in touch on the text with universal credit. Why so long? What needs to be done that takes weeks to resolve that can't be done just in a few days? Uh, Sami on Twitter says restoring much needed funding after universal credit cuts is vital, but so is tackling problems like the five week wait, which we've been talking yeah. about, which plays such an important part in creating hardship and driving people to food banks and other emergency support. And Kat also on Twitter says give it in advance. Obviously, there are procedures for claiming back over payments when it's needed. Um, if they've been paid uh, too much when they start work, request it back or deduct it from wages. Do keep those comments coming. Heidi Allen, it's worth saying as well, it isn't just an issue, as you've outlined there, about the advances and making sure that people don't get into debt. Other things that people tell us they have problems with universal credit is things like the single payment to couples, which primarily goes to a man. If you're in an abusive yeah. relationship, that is a way to another way to control a woman. Of course, men are also in abusive relationships and it could flip the other way. Um, and also the money for rent goes straight to the claimant and not to the landlord. And for many people, as we've been hearing there, if they're making a choice between heating, eating, buying school sh shoes for their kids, they're going to do that before they pay their rent and then they get the rent arrears. Surely these need to be addressed as well. Yes, you are absolutely right. If we had a longer programme and I had my, my to-do list, I could give you dozens of things that need fixing at Universal Credit. So surely it needs to be scrapped. It's not working, is it? No, no, I, I disagree because I think for... Um, so, for example, I had an email actually from a constituent this morning that's just moved on to it. And although he found the, the claim process online desperate, as we've heard um, from your um, audience guest today, Actually, when he visited a job centre, he found a brilliant work coach who absolutely sorted him out, found him um, some work and gave him the support that he needed. So it is working um, when, when all the stars are aligned. But I, and you're right, there are lots of other things are included in the domestic violence issue, which our select committee again has just done a report on. We're asking for those um, single payments to be split, at least the housing and the, and the childcare element should be taken out uh, and given separately, to, principally to the, the wife or the woman, not always. But Heidi often. Allen, let me jump but in because Neil, Neil is next to you and he's nodding and shaking and uh, making various oh. facial expressions. It's so I feel, it's, I feel it's right that he should be able to speak to you. Go ahead, Neil. Um, so, I mean, my biggest issue was as a cancer patient recovering, um, I wasn't able to work full time. Um, I submitted my tenancy agreement and I was given with all of my universal credit, I paid my rent and I had £30 a month to live on. Um, when I went to my work coach and told her about this, I was given a voucher for a food bank. Um, in this country, it's such a shame that people are forced to use food banks and everything. And I mean, I, what happened to me, I didn't ask for it. Mm -hmm. um, and the only reason I've managed to get through the past year and a bit is because of my fantastic support networks and everything. And um otherwise someone would be completely screwed over i mean i mean i'd be homeless if it wasn't for um my my support my friends and my family um and i'm i'm really happy for mcmillan doing this um with me to to highlight this issue for cancer patients and I think that's important. I mean, Macmillan are saying up to 26,000 cancer patients, including those who have a terminal diagnosis, are at risk of hardship if this failing system is rolled out. 
Do you ever think, Devon, that you wished you hadn't come up with this? Because what you're telling us is the idea of universal credit that you came up with has not been rolled out. Does it, does it worry you that so many people are facing hardship? Uh, of course it's difficult to hear situations like Sarah's and Neil's and many thousands across the country that are in a, a similar situation. But I think you've got to remember a, a lot of... The, the challenges that you've just described are exactly the same as under the legacy system, as I said. The, I know, but this was meant to be better. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, and I think exactly. that's the frustration. There are elements of it that are better, so about half of people find it, about half of everyone on Universal Credit said it was easier to claim than having to go through lots of different agencies. It's nowhere near high enough, because that's you, you want that to be sort of 95%. The opportunities, as I said, to reimagine the system haven't really been taken. And it's been born in this environment where you're trying to take money out of the system. And a lot of decisions, I feel, have been made to try and um, make it as administratively straightforward or, or, or the same as the system that it's replacing. And rather than taking opportunities to try and reimagine it and, and, and make life uh, much easier for, for, for the people on it. So many people still getting in touch with us with their experiences of universal credit. Thank you ever so much for doing so. This text says, I'm disabled, I'm unfit for work and I have a degenerative disease. So unless a cure is found, I won't ever be able to work again. Yet I've had my disability benefit stopped completely. This is not only discriminatory, it's made my health deteriorate due to being pushed into poverty. Emma on Twitter says the extra pressure on the NHS, the benefit system has caused people fall into depression, anxiety, and in turn that has an impact on physical systems. It's taken three years of fight for me to get what I deserve and I'm simply exhausted. I will stand up for all who deserve better. Uh, Lawrence has got in touch. When you move over to Universal Credit, the system does not show if you are an ESA support group claimant, that means you're deemed unfit for work, but you're still hounded to go into work. And uh, Claire on Facebook says, universal credit is a joke. I was 12 weeks with nothing. I had to borrow money off friends. I owe money to everybody. When I told uh, universal credit was given to me, I was told absolutely no problem. Thank you ever so much for all of those. Um, if you want to share your experiences of universal credit, please do. The hashtag is Victoria Live. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you for your time this morning. Thank you.